So far, we've considered just the simplest nucleophilic substitution elimination reactions. Each SN2 and E2 mechanism that has been presented consists of precisely one step, and each SN1 and E1 reaction that's been presented consists of precisely two steps. However, you are going to encounter um, many instances where other elementary steps are incorporated into these um, really fundamental mechanisms that we're going to study. And so this makes the mechanisms a little longer and a little bit more complex, but you can do it. The most common of these steps are the proton transfer steps and carbocation rearrangements. So in this section, we are going to talk about um, some helpful tips on how to incorporate those. Because of the greater complexity resulting from including these additional steps, it's important for you to gain a sense of how they can be incorporated into a mechanism in a reasonable way. This, and so this section is really focused on helping you gain um, what we call a lot of times chemical intuition. Um, which is sometimes you, you look at a mechanism and you're like, ooh, that doesn't seem right. Um, and so there's four general steps to help us with this, or four general rules. The first three rules are really going to focus on proton transfer steps, um, just honestly because they're very, very common. And then the fourth rule pertains to carbocation rearrangements. Although they're introduced in the context of SN2, SN1, E2, and E1 reactions, these rules are going to apply generally to all reaction mechanisms, and we'll use these rules all the way through um, ah, gen uh, organic chemistry too. So you're going to you're going to use these rules a lot. So you need to try to apply the lessons you learn here each time you encounter a new reaction mechanism. So let me make sure I didn't forget any. I got real excited about talking, and I want to make sure I didn't forget anything here. And so the two most common. Additional steps you're going to see are proton transfer and then carbocation rearrangements. Okay, and so let's jump in and start to look at some of the rules. So the very first rule we have um, is to avoid the appearance of incompatible acids and bases. And so what this means is that strong acids do not appear in mechanisms with basic conditions, and strong bases do not appear in mechanisms under acidic conditions. Under basic conditions, the equilibrium concentration of strongly acidic species is very, very small, and under acidic conditions, the equilibrium concentration of really strongly basic species is also very, very small. Now, proton transfer steps are fast. They're so fast. So they can be incorporated before or after another elementary step as necessary to avoid incompatible species like a basic species when you know you have an acidic solution. Now, you can gain a sense of how fast proton transfers are by recalling the acid-base titrations that you did in general chemistry lab. Um, changes in the pH of a solution occur almost instantaneously on the addition of an acid or base. On the other hand, many organic reactions are going to require hours to reach completion, even at elevated temperatures. To apply this rule correctly, we must be able to recognize strong acids and bases. Um, if you can't do that, you're not going to be able to apply this rule. So I want to review that. You may recall from general chemistry that H3O plus, that hydronium ion, is a strong acid, and OH minus, or hydroxide, is a strong base. Now, those species are really convenient cutoffs for defining other strong acids and bases. So, strong acids are roughly as strong or stronger than H3O plus, and weak acids are significantly weaker than H3O plus. Strong bases are roughly as strong or stronger than OH minus, whereas weak bases are significantly weaker than OH minus. I wrote those two different ways, I apologize. 
Um, remembering these cutoffs, we can use pKa values to characterize acids and bases. Um, I just want to remind you that the stronger of the two acids is the one with the lower pKa value, and the stronger of the two PACE is, is the one that has the weaker conjugate acid, right, which is the conjugate acid with a higher pKa value. So let me write that down, just, just as a friendly reminder. The stronger of two acids is the one with the lower pKa value. The stronger of the two bases is the one that has the weaker conjugate acid which is the conjugate acid with the higher pKa value. So a higher pKa value means that conjugate base is going to be stronger. So um, the pKa value of H3O plus is zero. Right? So any acid whose pKa is less than zero is going to be a strong acid. The conjugate acid of hydroxide here, right, is water. And water has a pKa value of 14. So any base whose conjugate acid has a pKa that is greater than 14 is going to be a strong base. Now, I want to show you some examples, and they're, they're written here. I just didn't feel like there was a, a value in writing these again. So you can see that strong acids are things like H3O+. Um, there's a protonated alcohol there. There's a, um, a, a CH3, CH2+. Um, examples of weak bases are things like water, NH3, uh, Cl, Br-, I-, um, I'm sorry, I skipped down to weak bases. Examples of weak acids are things like water, um, NH3, H4, N+, CH3, N3+, strong bases, OH-, H2, N-, CH3-, where there's a negative, it's a carbon ion on the carbon, and H-. And then weak bases are H2O and H3, um, Cl, Br-, I-, HSO4-, and HCO2-. Now, I want you to notice there's some patterns that emerge in these classifications. For example, strong bases here, right, generally have a negative charge localized on an atom for the, from the first or second row of the periodic table. So these guys generally have a negative charge. on an atom from the first or second row of the periodic table. Strong acids generally have a positive charge, but some positively, that's, that's so hard though, because some positively charged, um, uh, acids like NH4 plus are weak. So this is where estimating pKa's is really, really helpful for us and can be applied as we go through mechanisms. Let's work on applying these ideas towards substitution reactions. Um, let's look at this substitution reaction here. So this is a substitution reaction. We can recognize it's a substitution reaction because OH, right, when we look at this, um, 
we've got the bromine here as our leaving group, and we have a new bond. So I want to show you, right, if we look at this part right here, this is the new part that's here, and it's substituted for the hydrogen on that OH. So the O stays, but we substitute out that hydrogen there. So um, this is under basic conditions. The way that you can recognize that is because you have OH minus. Now, OH minus is, is going to be that mark of a strong base. So we know going in, this is under basic conditions. So let's look at some proposed mechanisms for how this happens. In one proposed mechanism, right, what we see here are the OH ions coming out to attack this and these bromine leaving. Now, one of the things I want you to note in your book is when there's a multi-step mechanism, they're going to show you the first elementary step here and then the second elementary step. It's just really helpful. Um, and so we have an SN2 reaction here. Now, this doesn't form or doesn't work. This is unreasonable because the product of the first step gives us a really strongly acidic proton. So that's a protonated alcohol. That's really strongly acidic. And that's incompatible with basic conditions. A more reasonable mechanism is this mechanism where the base comes in first and removes a proton. Then the electrons go here onto the oxygen. This is deprotonated. That makes sense in a basic uh, solution. These now come over and we have the SN2 reaction and the bromine goes here. And now we have the product in our, in our uh, bromine minus there. When you look at this, double check that you are not forming any strong acids. And as we can see, no strong acids are formed here. So all we've done are switch the two steps, right? And this is a reasonable mechanism because we don't have any strong acids. Let's look at an example of a substitution reaction under acidic conditions. So in this reaction, it's a substitution reaction. And what we see here, just like before, is we have the OH here and that bromine is substituted for the OH. Now, notice H2SO4 is a strong acid, so it's under acidic conditions. HBr is also an acid. Um, and so those are, those are some keys that this is a, this is an under acidic conditions, right? We see that strong acid there. And so we would expect no bases to be formed. Okay. Now let's look at some proposed mechanisms. There's a proposed SN1 mechanism here where the OH group leaves through heterolysis, but this doesn't make sense. Because when this happens, this guy is a strong base, and we know we're in an acidic solution, and strong bases just aren't going to form in acidic solutions. And so this would be incompatible with the acidic conditions of the reaction. A more reasonable mechanism is shown here, where the OH group is protonated first, right? And then the leaving group departs as water instead of OH minus. And we notice we don't have any strongly basic species appearing at any stage in this mechanism. And so this would be a reasonable um, mechanism for the reaction conditions. So I want us to do an example of this. Um, we're going to draw a reasonable mechanism for the elimination reaction shown here, assuming it takes place by an E1 mechanism. Okay, and so what we see here um, when we evaluate this is this right here is going to be our leaving group and we're going to form this double bond here. Now, I want you to understand and be able to identify that H2SO4, right, is an acid. So this is going to be under acidic conditions. We should not form any bases, okay? 
So let's go through the steps uh, here. What are the first and second steps of the regular two-step E1 mechanism? And so when we look at those steps of a regular E1 mechanism, right, what we would see happening is that the first thing that you're going to get, right, is your leaving group is going to pop off to form a carbocation. Now, the second step then would be that, and we would also form OCH3 minus. The second step would be that water would come in or another base, right? And grab this proton and then these electrons would jump here and they would form the double bond here. Now, right, when we look at this, we need to ask ourselves, do any incompatible species appear in the two-step E1 mechanism for this reaction? The regular two-step E1 mechanism has us form OCH3 minus here, and that sucker is a strong base. That's a deprotonated alcohol. Those are really strong bases. And so since this reaction takes place under acidic conditions, that is incompatible. And so this mechanism here then is unreasonable. All right. So the next question we need to ask ourselves, is it possible to incorporate a proton transfer step in a reasonable way to avoid the formation of incompatible species? Okay, so because this is gonna form our incompatible species when it pops off, is there something we can do before it leaves to make it more compatible? That's the question we're gonna ask ourselves. And the answer here is yes, we can do that. We can do a proton transfer reaction. Right? Where we can use the acid. Okay. And these electrons come and they grab that proton. Those electrons go on the acid. And what we have here now is a protonated alcohol. Now that protonated alcohol is really stable, right? And so it will pop off just like that through the step of heterolysis. and we'll form a carbocation intermediate that looks just like that. And then what we'll see here is water will come in, steal the adjacent proton, and those electrons will go there. And now, and this was, by the way, an elimination, all right, and that's an elimination of H plus, plus H3O plus. And so we ask ourselves, are, do we have any, we also form CH3O minus here, incompatible species? And the answer is no, all right? Everything that we see here um, is an acid or a very weakly basic CH3OH. So we don't see any strong bases that are formed in our acidic solution. Now, some mechanisms that we see need to account for the removal of a proton at one site within a molecular species and the addition of a proton at another site with the same molecular species. And so I wanna show you this example. Um, what we have here is something called an oxirane where um, it's a triple bond, sorry, triple bond. It's a, there are three bonds that form a triangle and then the oxygen is right here, okay? And when it reacts with an H3, what we see is we can form two amino ethanol. Um, 
the, the reasonable first step is shown here in equation 834, uh, where an SN2 reaction is going to open the ring. And so we see these electrons come here and attack that carbon. Those electrons go in the oxygen. When that happens, these break and it kind of like swings open. And so that's where we have our oxygen, right? And then we have a NH3 here. Now I want you to compare this to our product. This, we need a proton to be removed and here we need a proton to be added. Um, and so the question is, how, how do we get from, from here to here, right? Um, and, and we could imagine that a proton is transferred directly from the nitrogen to the oxygen through an intramolecular proton transfer. So an intramolecular proton would be within the same molecule or within the same, um, uh, within the same molecule here. Um, the curved arrow notation for that proposed process is shown on the next slide. And so... When we look at this, intermolecular proton steps are generally unreasonable um, because you have several solvent molecules that typically reside between the acidic and basic sites at any time, making it difficult to achieve the direct transfer of a proton from one site to another. Um, so not reasonable because of solvent, just the number of solvent molecules that are around. Um, these solvent molecules can be weakly acidic or basic, and they invariably participate in the transfer of a proton from one site to another in a particular species. Now, this is called a solvent-mediated proton transfer. Um, we see a mechanism here, um, and so what we see here is that we have water, Water is both weakly acidic and weakly basic, so it's, it's not unusual for it to be hanging out. The electrons come here, they grab a proton from the water, those electrons go back on the OH- minus to form OH-, minus, and then water can come in again and remove this proton, and those electrons go back on the NH2 there. Um, so this, this is what we would consider a solvent-mediated proton transfer reaction. Now, the third general rule um, addresses the number of reactant species in a particular elementary step. And um, so what we know is that um, when we look at this proposed mechanism, um, it accomplishes the same proton transfers we saw previously on the previous slide, but it's considered unreasonable. Um, and the reason it's unreasonable is because it, it's, a, it's what we call a teramolecular step, and it's one where three reactants have to react simultaneously. These are generally unreasonable um, because an elementary step takes place in a single event, and so that would be the breaking or forming of bonds that occur simultaneously. So for a teramolecular step, it would require the collision of all three molecules at the same time. And so um, that's uh, <clears throat> that has just such a small probability. Um, it's it's just so unusual. By contrast, bimolecular or unimolecular steps are really reasonable um, because the bimolecular step requires the collision of just two species, and of course, a unimolecular step is a spontaneous transformation that doesn't require a collision with another reactant at all. Um, so we really don't ever want to see three or four or five things colliding, right? And so that one is pretty straightforward, which is really nice. Now, the last kind of um, thing we're going to talk about or in this particular section are carbocations. Um, carbocations have a net positive charge and lack an octet, so they are pretty unstable. Once they're formed, they tend to react quickly to become more stable. 
And we've seen this. They can undergo a coordination with a nucleophile to form an SN1 product, and they can also lose a proton to form E1 products. Um, they can also undergo carbocation rearrangements where both the reactant and the product carbocations are isomers of each other, so we've seen that as well. Um, SN1 reactions provide clear evidence of these carbocation rearrangements. Um, when we look here uh, at this equation, right, um, we see 2 iodo 3 methyl butane in water, and so it appears that the substitution occurs at this carbon atom, not the one that's initially attached to the leaving group. Now, the mechanism on the next slide is going to show us where where that carbocation rearrangement happens. So in step one, the leaving group leaves uh, through heterolysis just as the usual SN1 reaction. Now, that gives us I minus, and it also gives us a carbocation intermediate that's secondary in nature, right? So this is one of those secondary carbocation intermediates. Now, you can't when you you have to you have to catch this because when you look here you have to look here's the carbocation you have to ask yourself if the carbocation was here would it be more stable if it was here would it be more stable okay if the carbocation were to shift here it'd be a primary carbocation and that is not more stable than a secondary carbocation so that's not going to happen if the carbocation were to shift here, it would be a tertiary carbocation, and that would be more stable. And so this will undergo a hydride shift where these electrons will shift here, and there'll be a new um, hydrogen bond here, right? So there's a new bond here. We have a positive charge here. These electrons come down now, and they're going to undergo coordination, and then we end up with a proton transfer, and there is our alcohol. So what we see here is if your carbocation can shift, um, you'll have a carbocation shift if you can increase the stability. And so going from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation is going to increase the stability and make it more um, favorable, right? So uh, this leads us to rule four, where um, we basically can say, if an energetically favorable 1,2 hydride shift or 1,2 methyl shift competes with another possible elementary step, the carbocation rearrangement is usually faster. So a carbocation rearrangement step is usually faster than another elementary step. Other alkyl, I, I just want to remind you, other alkyl groups such as ethyl and propyl groups tend not to shift in carbocation rearrangements because those alkyl groups are really, really large. So ethyl and propyl groups tend not to shift because the alkyl groups are large. Right? Um, so one, two methyl ships, shifts we see pretty happen pretty quickly um, and hydride shifts happen pretty quickly. You need to pay attention anytime a carbocation is produced and look for a shift. You need to consider every, like every time a carbocation is produced, you need to think, can I have a 1,2 hydride shift? Can I have a 1,2 methyl shift? Okay. Um, so let's look at this example here. This is an SN1 mechanism involving um, a substrate and a nucleophile. We end up with this carbocation here. Um, when we look at this, we could end up with um, two possible carbocation rearrangements to consider. Um, we could have a hydride shift 
or a methyl shift. Um, and let's go on to that slide. Once the carbocation's produced, um, we see here in 8.41, it's gonna show a hydride shift. Um, and then equation 8.42 here shows a methyl shift. And so the question is, which one is going to happen? Um, as indicated here, I mean, there's a big red X. Um, the hydride shift doesn't take place because a more stable tertiary carbocation would be converted to a less stable primary one, right? And so that's just not going to happen. We Our, our carbocations um, tend to like to increase stability. On the other hand, the 1,2-methyl shift shown here is expected to take place rapidly because it produces a carbocation that has gained significant stability from resonance delocalization of the charge. Um, and so we can we can see here where the electrons could come here and help um, re uh, stabilize that. And then from there, we get a coordination step and a proton transfer step, and that completes our SM1 reaction. Now, this is a beautiful lead-in to the next, session, the next section where resonance delocalized intermediates uh, show up in mechanisms every so often. So um, when we look at this particular reaction, where 2-methyl-3-ene-2-ol is treated with hydrochloric acid, 1-chloro-3-methyl-but-2-ene um, is produced. Now, this is a substitution reaction, um, and it t appears to take place at the carbon atom that does not contain the leaving group, right? So we, we're attaching HCl here, um, not here. So what's going on? Well, this puzzle was explained by a carbocation rearrangement um, incorporated into an SN1 reaction. Um, and the reaction in equation 843 does undergo an SN1 mechanism, but um, uh, there's no carbocation rearrangement. And so how do we go through and explain this if there's no carbocation um, rearrangement that takes place? Well, the answer is resonance. So if we look in um, equation 844, this is the mechanism. Um, the carbocation that's produced in step two right here has two resonance structures. We've got this resonance structure and this resonance structure. And um, to produce the particular alkyl chloride um, shown here, the chlorine comes in and attacks the terminal um, carbon. Now, when resonance structures are incorporated into mechanisms like that, you need to keep in mind two really important points. Um, and the first one is the conversion of one resonance structure to another. is not an elementary step. Right? Um, the individual resonance structures, I want you to remember this, are hypothetical, and the one true species is the resonance hybrid. Um, so the resonance structures are just different depictions of the same species. And so this leads us to the second point, that when an intermediate... has two or more resonance structures. Any resonance structure can be shown to participate as a reactant in the next step of the reaction. So you'll see this pop up pretty frequently. Um, these will occur um, using brackets here. So 
in um, the previous equation, 844, the second resonance structure was used, but the first resonance structure could have been shown instead um, right here, right? Notice, though, that the choice of resonance structure will impact the curved arrow notation for the subsequent elementary step. Um, when we, if, and I can't flip back because it'll stop and break apart, but if you look back at 844, we have a single curved arrow that was used to depict the final coordination. And if we were to use this resonance structure, we'd need to use two curved arrows. Um, either, of course, would be counted as correct, um, but that's just kind of something that you'll see depending on which resonance structure that you use and whichever one that you're really comfortable with. Well, thank you for sticking with me. I know this was a really long um, screencast. We've had a couple long screencasts in uh, Chapter 8 because the sections are particularly long. Um, we will do some problems in class and work on this. And then the next um, chapter will dig into a little bit more about making some decisions between when we would expect there to be an SN2 reaction versus an E2 reaction and those types of things.